It's a great uh, pleasure for me uh, as Dean of Osgoode Hall Law School, and I think uh, I'm looking at mostly familiar faces, but to those I haven't met, I'm Lauren Salson. Uh, and as Dean, uh, one of the great um, uh, pleasures is being able to welcome esteemed visitors and guests when they come through uh, Osgoode. And uh, it's hard to think of a guest uh, more esteemed than uh, Justice Bandari, who is, uh, as uh, almost all of you will know, a member of the uh, International Court of Justice and also a former member of the uh, Supreme Court in India. And you're going to hear more about his career and his contributions uh, from my colleague, uh, Professor uh, Francois tanguay Renault in a moment. But uh, I wanted to just say a word uh, to set the context for how significant uh, both Osgood's relationship uh, has been uh, in India and the role that uh, Justice Bhandari played in that respect. Uh, as I hope most of you will know, we have uh, interests in and relationships with uh, lawyers and judges and law schools in many parts of the world, and we value them. Uh, but there's some places where we found a particular affinity, where we have a kinship not only uh, with uh, some of our graduates and uh, some of uh, the students who come here to study, but also in values and in a sense of uh, the possibilities of what a law school and law students can do. And that's very much what we found uh, in India. And on a number of trips over the past uh, several years, Osgood faculty, students, and alumni have found a remarkably uh, warm reception, and it's led to some great partnerships with the law schools. It's led to uh, a burgeoning clerkship program for our students, uh, and Justice Bandari was the inaugural host uh, of two uh, clerks at the Supreme Court uh, in India to kick off that particular uh, incarnation of a global clerkships program, and uh, very grateful to him for not only welcoming the Osgood students, uh, but for paving the way for the extraordinary demand we've now encountered for more students to have that experience. So we've worked now with other judges uh, in uh, Delhi. We look forward to expanding it. We look forward uh, to, uh, again, more opportunities at um, the international court level. Uh, and we found uh, that this is really something that only happens uh, through individual uh, people and champions. And Justice Bandari has been the kind of uh, individual when uh, we met him and told him a little bit about Osgood and uh, heard about his experiences with Canada. We had a great uh, meeting of minds at the outset. Uh, and initially we were, uh, you know, bittersweet um, in congratulating him on his elevation in uh, 2012 to the International Court because we worried we had lost such a good friend at the Supreme Court level. But uh, as these things tend to do, one relationship has led to uh, others and we're finding uh, now great um, uh, threads through the Indian judiciary, through our alumni, through the academics on uh, both sides of uh, new initiatives that we uh, can build and are eagerly uh, working on. So uh, to those who have an interest in South Asia, an interest in uh, India, an interest in international justice, uh, we found uh, that Osgood has a, um, uh, a great network and that network uh, in so many ways has revolved around uh, Justice Bandari. So we're very grateful for all those reasons that he's taken uh, time uh, in his North American swing uh, to be with us. Uh, looking forward to hearing his thoughts on uh, international justice and the work of the court uh, today. And it's great to see uh, such a, a mix of faculty members, graduate students, uh, and JD students at all levels, including uh, friends uh, at York from other disciplines uh, here with us uh, today. So uh, before asking you to welcome uh, the judge, let me call upon uh, Francois to come up and tell you a little bit more about his remarkable career and contributions uh, and look forward to discussing and hearing your ideas for our institutional uh, growth and the things that we can and should be doing uh, in that part of the world and the ways to ensure we're bringing more people uh, from the uh, Indian legal community here to be with us in Toronto. So look forward to that, and please join me in welcoming Professor Francois tanguay Renault. Mr. Dean, Madam Former Dean, Associate Dean, Former Associate Deans, colleagues, 
Wonderful students, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Francois Tanguy Renaud. I'm professor here at Osgoode Hall Law School. I'm also the director of the Jack and May Nathanson Center on Transnational Human Rights, Crime uh, and Security, uh, which is delighted to be co-sponsoring uh, this distinguished public lecture uh, today. Indeed, our distinguished uh, lecturer will be known to uh, many of you as one of the great global jurists of our day and one of India's most distinguished judges, uh, Dr. Justice Dalvir Bandari of the International Court of Justice. It's my great privilege and honor today to be introducing him to you. Native of Jodhpur in the Indian state of Rajasthan, Justice Bandari had a distinguished and successful career as an attorney at law for 23 years, arguing countless cases before the Supreme Court of India, before he was himself nominated to become a judge of the higher Indian judiciary in the Delhi High Court in 1991. He then went on to have an illustrious career on the bench, which also saw him serve as the Chief Justice of the Bombay High Court, and from 2005 to 2012 as a senior judge of the Supreme Court of India. There, he rendered many landmark judgments, leading to deep changes in the Indian social fabric, such as, for example, the incorporation of the irretrievable breakdown of marriage as a ground of divorce under the Hindu Marriage Act of 1955 his various orders about the constitutional right to food and its elaboration under Indian jurisprudence led to significantly higher quanta of food grains being released in India to those living below the, po the poverty line. His judgments also led state governments to make provisions for night shelters for homeless people all over the country, adjudicating over the right to free and compulsory education for children Justice Bandari's orders also led to the availability of basic infrastructural amenities in primary and secondary schools throughout India. These are only a few examples of the many crucial contributions that this jurist of great talent, integrity, humanity, and dare I say courage and vision made in his homeland, thus affecting the lives of hundreds of millions of people. I could also have mentioned many of his other landmark judgments in fields, in fields as diverse as public interest litigation, constitutional law, criminal law, civil procedure, administrative law, arbitration law, insurance, and banking, as well as family law. However, had I done so, I would, it would have taken me really a, the better part of the day. And I know that you're all here to hear Justice Bandari and not me, so I will simply abstain from doing so. Now, Justice Bandari made all these contributions, of course, before he departed for the Netherlands in 2012, uh, after having been elected by the General Assembly of the United Nations, as well as the Security Council, which is no small feat in this antagonistic day and age, uh, to one of our planet's highest judicial offices as a judge of the International Court of Justice. In a way, uh, Justice Bandari seems to have been destined for this role. As part of the Indian judiciary, uh, he was always one of the foremost uh, champions, and I would say adept users of comparative law, and quickly asserted himself as an expert of private as well as public international law. His commitment to international law as a field uh, was also evident from his early days uh, on the bench when in 1994 he became an executive member of the Indian chapter of the International Law Association. He was also the chairperson of the Delhi Center of, International, of the International Law Association for several years and was instrumental in setting up the Rajasthan chapter of this illustrious international association. More recently, in 2007, he was unanimously uh, elected as president of the India International Law Foundation and was also awarded an honorary life membership of the Indian Society of International Law. Ladies and gentlemen, you have before you today no less than a giant of the law. A giant who, uh, fortunately for us, has been a dear friend of this leading Canadian law school for many years now. A particular note, as Dean Sawson uh, has remarked, uh, is the fact that Justice Bandari uh, was the first Indian judge to welcome some of Osgood's top students to work as legal interns in his chamber while he was still a judge at the Supreme Court of India. Justice Bandari, we at Osgood Hall Law School and New York University are deeply grateful for your friendship. And once again, 
honored that you've decided to make time in your busy schedule to travel all the way from Europe to be with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Without further ado, then, I welcome Justice Dalvir Bandari of the International Court of Justice, who will speak to us today about judging at the International Court of Justice. Justice Bandari. Good afternoon and greetings to all of you. Dean, Associate Dean, Distinguished Professor, Director of the Netherlands Center, dear law students of this great institution, I deem it a great privilege and honor to address this distinguished gathering. Before I come to this subject, I would like to mention that I had the privilege of having two students of your university as my interns while I was in the Supreme Court of India. At the same time, I had the students from Harvard, Yale, Columbia, Michigan, and Northwestern. And I have no hesitation in saying so the students from this institution are second to none. We also had the privilege of having a very distinguished faculty member, Mrs. Puri, in our international conference. She read a paper and actively participated. And her contribution and her paper was acknowledged one of the finest paper in that international conference, which was inaugurated by the President of India, Pranab Mukherjee. Congratulations to the faculty members, congratulations to the law students for making this institution such an important and prestigious institution. Before I come to the subject, I would like to speak a little bit about the law clerkship which was mentioned by the director. Indian Jurisprudence can be very fascinating for the international students. And in my opinion, apart from Supreme Court of India, they can also clerk with the high court judges in India because every day they encounter a very large number of cases of different variety. And one can get to learn quite a bit with them. So when I go back to India, I'll ensure that some of the High Court judges take interest. And some of you who are interested in having some training with the judges of the High Court, they would be willing to provide it to you. Now, the subject of today's discussion is judging at the International Court of Justice. I'm getting this experience of teaching in a class almost after 40 years, 43 years, when I was a part-time lecturer in the Jodhpur University and used to teach constitutional law. I'm getting that kind of feeling today. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you a little bit about International Court of Justice. I'll also tell you how we arrive at a judgment in the International Court of Justice, which is very different from any other jurisdiction, whether it's a civil law or a common law. ICJ, as we briefly call it, is a principal judicial organ of the United Nations. It was established by the Charter of the United Nations, signed on 26 June 1945 at San Francisco in pursuance of the primary purposes of the UN to bring about by peaceful means and in conformity with the principle of justice and international law, adjustment and settlement of international dispute or situation which might lead to breach of peace. As you all know, the seat of the International Court of Justice is at The Hague, Netherlands. The Permanent Court of International Justice 
was constituted in 1922. This was the predecessor of International Court of Justice. PCIJ is popularly known, was an outstanding success between 1922 and 1940. It rendered judgment in 29 cases between states and gave 27 advisory opinion to the United Nations organs and its other subsidiaries organization. And the most satisfying part is all those opinions were acted upon, all those judgments were adhered by all the member states. A considerable degree of continuity between PI, PCIJ and ICJ has however been maintained. The statute of the ICJ is practically identical with that of the PCIJ as were the rules of both institutions until the court adopted a revised set of rules in 1975 with the object of simplifying and accelerating proceedings. In October 1945, PCIJ decided at his final session to transfer his archive and effects to ICJ, which was also to sit in the Peace Palace at The Hague on 31st January 1946. The judges of the PCIJ resigned, and on 5th February 1946, the UN General Assembly and Security Council elected first members of the ICJ. I think this is a place worth visiting, not because I sit there, but in the same Peace Palace, you have a permanent court of arbitration, you have a Hague Academy of International Law, all of you are most welcome. If you are there, let me know. We'll make all arrangements for you to have a close look of these institutions. Now, as was mentioned that members of the court or judges of the court are elected by the Security Council and General Assembly. Every member has to get absolute majority in both General Assembly and Security Council before he is elected. It's a very difficult process because almost all 193 member nations of the United Nations, they vote for this. And unless one get absolute majority, one can't be elected. The qualification for being a member is that he should be qualified to become the member of the highest court of his own country, or he is a distinguished academician of international repute in the field of international law. Now, the, we have 15 members in the ICJ. They're all from different countries. There cannot be two members from one country. Now, to have a global representation the same procedure has been adopted for ICJ, which has been there for the Security Council. There are three members from Africa, two from Latin America, three from Asia, five from Western Europe, and two from Eastern Europe. The idea is all the major legal system and judicial system should be represented because it's a world court. Once elected, members of the court represent neither the government of their own country nor any other authority. They are independent judges whose first task is to make solemn declaration in open court that they will exercise their power impartially. It's not exceptional for a judge to vote against position taken by his or her own country in a case which is before the court. Now, those countries who do not have the representation in the ICJ, and if their matter is before the court, then they are entitled to appoint ad hoc judge, as was done in one case 
from Canada. An ad hoc judge also take the solemn declaration, and once he is elected as a member for that particular course case, then he has the same power as any other member of the court. The court also elect president and vice president. They are elected from the members for a period of three years. Now, the applicable law is under Article 38 of the statute, international convention and treaties, international custom, general principle of law recognized by civilized nation. Now, there are two official languages, as perhaps you have in the Canadian Supreme Court, French and English. Now, the parties are free to file their pleadings either in French or English. The registry of the International Court of Justice has to translate the entire set of documents from French to English or English to French before they are distributed. The proceedings are ordinarily in public unless the party requests the court to have it in camera. So all proceedings are open for public, uh, press, interested uh, students and others. The entire funding of the United, uh, of the International Court of Justice is borne by the United Nation. The parties are not required to pay anything either towards administrative charges or towards the linguistic charges or for translation. And if some countries can't afford even the fee of the councils who appear before ICJ, then they can apply to the United Nations Trust. This is a trust which was created in 1989, and some funds are made available to a poorer nation to, to get the case adjudicated before the International Court of Justice. All judgments are final without appeal. If either of the parties challenges its meaning or scope, the only possibility open is it are to make a request for interpretation or for revision. Now here I would like to mention it's a unique thing which is there in the International Court of Justice that a judgment which is delivered a long time ago, ago, a party can approach the court for its interpretation regarding meaning and scope. That's why judges of the International Court are reluctant to talk about any specific case. For example, a very famous dispute between Thailand and Cambodia regarding a temple issue was determined in 1962. After 50 years, the Cambodia has come to the court and wants interpretation of the scope and meaning of the judgment. So therefore, to talk about any individual case can be difficult and embarrassing for any member of the court because you never know when the matter can come up again before the court. And secondly, surprisingly, that even after 50 years, when a reply was filed by Thailand, an objection to the limitation has not been taken. That now Cambodia is approaching the court after 50 years and court should not entertain the petition. They have argued on merit, but not on this aspect. Therefore, that is a little problem for any member of the ICJ to talk about any particular case which is pending or which has been decided. Now I'll tell you about a very interesting aspect regarding how the judgments are written. It's entirely different from a civil law system and a common law system. I have been part of a common law system for a few decades as a lawyer and a judge. It's entirely different. There's an intense deliberation among the member before a judgment is arrived at. 
Now, uh, at the expiration of the period, a deliberation is held at which President of the Court outlines the issues which, in his opinion, will require discussion and decision by the Court. Any judge may then comment on the statement or call attention to any other issue in question which he considered relevant. Thereafter, every judge, after oral proceedings are terminated, within a prescribed time, and normally four weeks are given, each member has to write a judicial note, which is like an individual judgment. And unless that judgment is deposited with the registrar uh, within the time prescribed, a judge is not entitled to get copies of the other judicial notes written by his other colleagues. Therefore, this is a very important exercise that all 15, and sometimes 16 or 17, because if both parties are not represented, they like to have their ad hoc judges. So there have been cases where we had 17 judges, and all 17 of them will write individual judgments. And no one knows what the other has written. And you have to deposit it at a specific time, and then only you're entitled to the copies of the other judgment. Now, some of them will write in English, some of them will write in French. They are translated by our registry, then distributed among the other members. Thereafter, we have a first reading of the judgment, which is also very unique. The, all the 15, 16, or 17 members sit in a room, and all judicial notes written by judges are discussed at threadbare. By inverse seniority, the junior most in the service, his judicial note is taken first. And he is expected to give his views on every issues. Then that judgment is evaluated, criticized by other 15 members. And this exercise goes on for days together, sometimes three days, four days. And every word uh, which a judge has written perhaps come out in those deliberations. Thereafter, uh, by the end of the whole process, the president would know that majority of members have taken a particular point of view then a drafting committee is elected. The president will nominate it, but each member by secret vote will endorse that or may not endorse that. And that drafting committee will take the points of all the members who have given a majority judgment and prepare a draft judgment. And that draft judgment is brought back to the court and that's called the first reading of the judgment. Now, at that stage, the, it is translated in other language, and word to word, that judgment is read both in French and English in the court. And members are free to make comments, their criticism, and all that is taken note by the members of the drafting committee. And after all that exercise is over, then they will incorporate all those suggestions given by majority uh, people who are in the majority, and then bring out another judgment. That is called a second reading of the judgment. In second reading of the judgment, uh, substance of the matters are not discussed, but again, we will deal with it paragraph by paragraph, make some changes in a style of uh, writing or choice of words, etc. That's how the judgment is finalized. At that stage, some of them will indicate they would like to write separate opinion. Some of them may say that I like concurring opinion, though I agree with the conclusion, but I like to have different reasons 
Some of them may say, we'll write a dissenting note. So all that is done at that stage and brought out before the court. So the point I'm making is, is such an elaborate and intense exercise, which is not done in any other jurisdiction. I'm aware of the common law system. I was a judge of Delhi High Court uh, for about 13 and a half years. Now, if you are sitting singly, when a case is argued before you, immediately after the case is over, you dictate the order in the court. If you are in a division bench of two judges, then you talk to your colleague in a small matter. If he does not have a different opinion, a senior judge will dictate the order in the court, and that's how the order is passed. If there's an intricate or difficult matter where judge would like to reflect on the matters more, then they may reserve that judgment. And a senior judge may write judgment and give it to the junior judge. Either he may agree or he will give a dissenting judgment. But there is no such in-depth deliberation as we find in the International Court of Justice. The same thing in the Supreme Court is little more than the High Court, but nowhere, anywhere close to what is done by the International Court of Justice. This part perhaps is not known to many people. That's why the time taken by the ICJ in deciding a case is taken long, primarily because of the reason that every word, every sentence is properly weighed, evaluated before a final judgment is arrived at. Now, at the end of the exercise, a vote is taken on every issue from every member, again by inverse seniority. On each issue, everyone has to give a vote, either he's against it or he's for it. And that's how uh, the judgment is prepared. And ultimately, the judgment will say, on this point, out of 15, eight has said yes, seven have said no, with an openness towards other sources of law because of pluralistic legal experience I have had in India. Hence, we can say that our personal conception of law are informed by our experience with different legal system or normative sources. This is a legal pluralism at the individual level. The conception of legal pluralism as is lived experience and brought Professor McDonald to remark the very idea of law must be autobiographical. But not only individuals have plural legal identities, societies and other groups are also locus to legal pluralism in this vein, exchanges, common endeavors, involving many jurists of different legal background give rise to some form of legal pluralism as well. Bearing in mind Professor MacDonald's world of wisdom, I would briefly discuss in a biographical terms the pluralistic nature of my experience as an adjudicator and more particularly as a judge at the International Court of Justice. This I'm doing because all of you are familiar with the Canadian system where we have the similar problems as we have in India. Michael Kirby, a very eminent Australian judge of the High Court, one of the le leading minds of uh, this century, has very aptly described, and I'll quote him, in a pluralist society, judges are essential equalizer. They serve no majority nor any minority either. Their duty is to law and to justice. They do not bend the knee to government, to particular religion, to the military, to money, or tabloid media, or screaming mob. In upholding law and justice, judges have a vital function in a pluralist society 
to make sure that diversity is respected and rights of all protected. Judging or adjudication is a fascinating experience. During my career as a judge of the Supreme Court, as a Chief Justice of Bombay High Court, and a judge of Delhi High Court, I had to grapple with pluralistic nature of Indian nation. The Indian legal arena reflects this pluralistic nature. This means, among other things, that judges may be called upon to adjudicate the same facts under different bodies of law. For example, in personal matter, such as family law or succession, a judge may apply a different set of norms if litigants are Muslims. For instance, a judge may acknowledge the legality of polygamous Islamic union, which would be an illegal practice for Hindu citizen. I'll give you a very interesting example. I had two friends. One was Muslim. He had three wives. And the matter came to the court, and the court said, no, according to his personal law, he is entitled to have. I had another friend who had a very happy married life, but following my other friend, he had another marriage, which was challenged later on, and he was convicted. Because the different personal laws were made applicable to Hindus and Muslims. So in a pluralistic society, there are some laws which are applicable for all, like criminal law is made applicable for all. But the personal laws are governed. Christians have a different personal laws. Hindus have different personal laws. Muslims have different personal laws. And they are adjudicated differently by the same judge. In one case, there is a conviction. In another case, there is no offense, because they belong to different religious groups. As a judge of the ICJ, I had the opportunity to deal with such legal pluralism, but on a global scale, indeed, having to decide an international dispute involving at least two states with a bench of at least 14 other judges, all from different nationalities, means, and we each bring different ways of thinking and conceptualizing the law to the table, an ultimate aim of serving international justice. Although the court has its own ways of adjudicating international dispute, they are not free from at least one of the main legal traditions. Much could be said about the influence of civil and common law in functioning of the court, but I will only refer to two particular instances to give us a sense of how set tradition influenced the work of the court. For example, now in the ICJ, we have civil system, civil law system, we have a common law system. Unlike common law, the correspondence with the parties is carried out by the registry of the court. And the intense exercise is done before a matter comes before the court. This is a civil law practice. But when it comes to common law, a stare decisis is not applicable. We are not bound by precedents. So in the same court, we have a two system which are prevalent. Unlike Indian judge, ICJ judge always has to apply the same body of law, that's international law for all the states, which can, of course, be found in a variety of sources, such as international convention, international custom, general principle of law recognized by civil, civilized nations, or subsidiary means for determination of rule of law, such as judicial decision and teaching of the most qualified publicist. Thus, the substantive national law of each of the ICJ judge is irrelevant in the adjudicative process. The pluralistic nature of the court adjudication process does not operate at that level. 
It rather operates through the interaction and, when possible, mingling of the intellectual endeavors of each judge. I believe the legal and cultural background of each international adjudicator informs his or her endeavor, thereby participating in some form of legal pluralism. This pluralistic deliberative process has merit not only because it involves bringing many great minds together, but because it's enabled the court to shed light on many, if not most, of the angles of the legal issue in what I consider a truly pluralistic approach. In this respect, it's worth noting that deliberative process of the court involves judges that come from civil and common law background, unitary and federal states, but also from religious and customary legal tradition. Let me remind you that we have judges from other countries amongst them are France, England, Russia, Somalia, Morocco. Even though most legal systems are in a way or another plural, the later two countries, Somalia and Morocco, express their legal plurality in a more explicit fashion than others. Indeed, the Federal Republic of Somalia has a mixed system of law encompassing civil Islamic customary law, the later being a traditional justice system, thereby elder members are vested with adjudicative power to resolve dispute as to the Kingdom of Morocco, we are dealing with a country where legal system integrate civil and Islamic law depending on all subject matter of the case. These are only but few examples of how legal plurality is represented by country of origin of the same judges of the ICJ. However, the impact of this plurality of legal tradition backgrounds is likely nuanced by the fact that many of the ICJ judges carried out their legal education in Western law faculties. This hardly means that their previous legal background has thus been obliterated. I rather believe that such experiences have contributed to the pluralism of our legal traditions, making our legal identities, the repositories of milang of legal culture capable of enhancing our sensitivity to a broader act of international legal issues. These observations about pluralistic practice of law that I have experienced as an adjudicator of the ICJ are echoed in the Canadian legal system context which is bijural and bilingual. With respect to bilingualism, it is worth noting that adjudication process at the ICJ is truly bilingual experience, similar to what I believe is happening in the Supreme Court of Canada. Each party can decide to plead in one of the official languages, but they will endeavor to plead in both languages, thus making the legal experience at the court a truly bilingual venture. Documents submitted to the court can be either in French or English, and judges can address the parties in any of the languages, so are the deliberation. Finally, decision is rendered in two versions, French and English. To conclude on this matter, by contributing to enriching and providing greater precision to the meaning of international law, this bilingual and pluralistic adjudicative process enlightened the work of International Court of Justice. With the United Nations system, International Court of Justice plays a central role in maintenance of international peace, security through adjudication of international dispute between the states. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Justice Bandari, for this very thought-provoking provoking and, and internal point of view into the history, makeup, structure of the International Court of Justice, as well as, as your situation in that environment as a judge confronted with many uh, sets of, of, of norms and bring with you your experience as a judge of the largest uh, democracy of the world, that is India, where uh, religious diversity, ethnic diversity, in fact, normative diversity is probably as is paroxysm <laughs> in terms of how, if we look at, at, the, at, at the globe right now. So Justice Bandari has kindly agreed uh, to take some questions um, with the caveat, as he mentioned, that he is not able to speak to any uh, specific cases. But again, uh, you have uh, a judge of the International Court of Justice here with you today. This, uh, this uh, opportunity is not likely to recur anytime soon, unless Justice Bandari, of course, decides to come back, and we'd be very happy to welcome him again. Uh, so I really encourage you to, to come down to one of these two microphones and uh, please share your question with, with the audience. So please come down to one of the microphones. Thank you. Thank you for a very entertaining talk. Another round of applause for this wonderful judge, please. I, ju I just have two brief questions. One, with a heightened sense of understanding of plural um, judgments and cultures, pluralistic. Why does the concept of quote unquote civilized nations still endure in the International Court of Justice? Has there been an interpretation of which countries continue to be uncivilized? And why should we retain that concept given the pluralistic understanding that you have elaborated? <clears throat> because literally, uncivilized nations means no pluralism. But with that understanding that you have elaborated, whether we should still retain the concept of civilized nations. Secondly, <clears throat> I missed the uh, distribution of judges at the International Court of Justice. If you can go along again, please, with the list. You said three from Africa, and I believe two from Asia. What is the other distribution? I didn't get this question. So I was wondering whether you could uh, go over again the, the distribution of seats on the International Court of Justice. Uh, Amongst which countries? Uh, thank you very much for your question. Uh, regarding the first question, uh, the civilized nation, all nations are civilized. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Uh, now the distribution of the work, the entire world has been, because we can have only 15 members in the International Court of Justice. Now, to ensure that all major legal system and judicial system are represented in the International Court of Justice, so the distribution has been uh, three from Africa, two from Latin America, five from Western Europe, three from Asia. Well, this has been a matter of some criticism that there is a greater representation of Eastern and Western Europe. And the other areas like Asia and Africa do not have the, that much representation. That is the issue, but at the moment, 15 members of the International Court of Justice are taken, as I mentioned to you in my initial address, in this fashion that two from Latin America, three from Africa, three from Asia, uh, five from Western Europe, three from Eastern Europe, likewise. So I think uh, my question um, May, uh, may build on that last uh, point you just raised about the uh, very uh, uh, mixed uh, origins of the court's members, not just in terms of global north and south, 
but also common law and civil law backgrounds. And I'm curious uh, whether you've seen emerging uh, a distinct culture from that conversation between civil law and common law specialists who are steeped in a particular way of understanding how we get to the truth or how we get to apply a legal doctrine to a factual situation and whether that uh, contributes to a distinct different kind of culture when you bring the civil and common law experts together and whether that has a, a different collegial atmosphere than you've experienced on the other courts you've been a member of. A very good question. Uh, as I indicated in my address, that some part of the civil law system has been incorporated in the International Court of Justice. Some part of the common law has been incorporated. And the whole idea is that how best we can arrive at the international adjudication between the states. What would be the best method by which we can arrive at a particular decision or dispute between the two nations. And the constant endeavor is to improve on the existing system. If we find any other thing which is in the civil law system or a common law system, I think the ICJ would be prepared to accept it. It's a gradual process, but it happens. The whole idea of having 15 members from all over the world is to ensure that all major legal system and judicial system are represented in the adjudicating process of the International Court of Justice. Now, if you see the history of the International Court of Justice, from time to time, they have been incorporating some aspects of the civil law system, some aspects of the common law system, but whole idea ultimately is how best we can adjudicate the inter -sea dispute between the states. Thank you for your speech. Um, I, I felt the comparison between... Uh, why don't you come here? <laughs> Why don't you come between oh, I found the, uh, the comparison between the Indian legal system and the ICJ very interesting. And I was wondering to what extent the ICJ right now takes into account local and re regional norms when they're making their decisions and whether you think that should be incorporated more in order to encourage legal pluralism. What, what are the questions? Uh, as I mentioned to you, the adjudication process is very, very intense. We have in-depth deliberation before a judgment is arrived at. And as I mentioned to you, in the first reading of the judgment and second reading of the judgment, each member is expected to express his views as freely as possible because it is in a closed door uh, room and each member brings out the points which are relevant from his own experience in the, in the judicial system in which he is accustomed to. For example, when I speak in the ICJ, by and large, it would emanate from a common law system. Sometimes it would look very odd to the other members who are not exposed to it. It's a very, very fascinating experience because each member has a different judicial or legal background. Some of them are diplomats. Some of them are academicians, professors from Cambridge or Harvard. Some of them have been politicians like Minister of External Affairs. Now, their approach to every problem is different, their way of thinking is different, their training is different, their exposure to a particular judicial and legal system is different. So they will give a different angle to every problem. And that's the whole beauty of the whole adjudication process. 
when you take everything into consideration and arrive at a judgment where every point of view has been taken place as far as possible. Thank you very much for a very enlightening lecture. Uh, my question is fairly simple, sir. Um, there is some kind of um, anecdotal evidence that judges do lobby one and another when they are trying to arrive at certain decisions. Um, for example, mention can be made of uh, the case of uh, Brown against the Board of Education. When, when the in initial votes first came out, it was more or less 6-3, and then there was some kind of uh, discussion, some would say lobby, and then eventually came down to 9-0 because Justice Warren wanted the court to speak with one voice. There was also another case where the, this is the U.S. Supreme Court decided on the right to legal representation. At the in initial counting of votes, it was uh, about 6-3 against. Then after they exchanged their judgment, eventually it came to 9-0. My question is, do judges at the ICJ lobby for uh, certain positions, either you, by way you, of... You ask a very pertinent question, and <laughs> this is a matter of a great debate. Uh, but I can tell you one thing. The election, as I mentioned to you, is before a General Assembly and a Security Council, where 193 nations participate. Individual lobbying is really not going to have much difference. The country lobbies for you. For example, when I uh, contested the election, the India did it. The victory or defeat is not of an individual. It is because of the country's lobbying. It is because the country's reputation, country's judicial system, country's democracy. All those factors take into, take into consideration. An individual can play a very limited role. But you're right, I take your point that whatever little lobbying individual does perhaps may not be conducive also. No, sir, I mean lobbying at the court. I mean, when you sit at the ICJ and there is a matter at the ICJ before the 15 or 17 or 18 or whatever, judges. No, lobbying. I mean, lobbying in terms of arriving at a decision amongst uh, the, in the deci judges. In the decision making process. Yes, sir. Uh, decision making process as I indicated to you in my address, where every individual member will express his or her views on a particular issue. Now, there could be a coincidence that my views may coincide with my African friends, my Asian friends, or my European friends, and four or five of them may think alike, but that's really not the lobbying. You are totally independent and you express your views. Your views may be biased because of your previous background, whether you come from a common law system, whether you law, come from a civil law system, whether you are an academician, you are a politician, you are a diplomat. So those will influence your decision. But there is nothing like four or five judges lobbying for a particular decision. This I have not experienced. They all experience, they will express their own views about particular issues. They may coincide with the views of some other members, and it may appear that four or five or seven of them have similar views. But there is nothing that we have an agenda that we will support a particular country, and we will not support another country. This doesn't happen, to my little experience. Thank you, sir. That's all. Any further questions? Yes. Professor Williams. Thank you very Thank you very much. That's extremely interesting, uh, particularly about the process of uh, making the decisions. And I'm wondering, you speak of these notes that uh, each judge deposits. Are those notes available, uh, or are archives of those notes available uh, from maybe a historical perspective for uh, scholars uh, uh. to study? They are in the archive of the International Court of Justice, but 
since they are not the final judgment, the individual note or the judgment of individual judge, which is written on in every matter, so they are not final judgments. Final judgment would be arrived at after long deliberation, after first reading, second reading, and final judgment is made. So they are with the archive of the International Court of Justice, but they are not made public. Because what happens is, initially I may have given a judicial note, but after hearing another 15 members, I may change it to some extent. I am persuaded by my other members to a particular point of view and change it. So they are not made public or they are not published. But ultimate judgment which is arrived at becomes a public property after it is pronounced in the open court. A follow-up question, yes. Right, well, uh, but since they are in an archive, even though they're not made public, presumably there are procedures for um, access to those notes uh, in individual cases. So for instance, if uh, uh, this, my colleague here wanted to see if there had been, you know, how the thinking had shifted behind a particular decision. Then there must be some. No, I, I, I quite see your point, mm -hmm. but uh, to my information, they are not made public for that purpose. Okay, thank you. Ali. Thank you, Justice Benary, for your talk. Um, my question is specifically about the impact of um, legitimacy or maintaining legitimacy on the decisions that um, ICJ makes. Specifically, um, any body that governs on the international level is always concerned about the legitimacy of its operation. And I wanted to know if at all this concern about maintaining legitimacy in the international sphere um, in any way or form impacts the decisions that um, ICJ makes. Thank you. So the, the question, as I understood it, was that uh, a, anybody rendering judicial decision is somehow concerned to preserve a certain uh, aura of legitimacy in front of the audience, the, the, the constituency for which they're adjudicating. Yeah, basically, if yeah. you make an unpopular decision um, or a decision that would maybe undermine the legitimacy of ICA, ICJ that is not popular with, um, especially nation states that are more powerful. Um, do you think that has an impact on the decisions that the ICJ makes, th that concern? As I mentioned to you, that there are some decisions which are very important from the public point of view. There are some decisions which are very important from the legal aspects. But the whole process to which I've been exposed in a short time, now, it is done entirely on the merit of the case, and the members of the court are usually not influenced by anything else. Okay. I guess I may have one final question myself. Oh, there's another one also, so please, please go, and then I'll ask my question last. Thank you for your talk today, Justice Bandari. Um My question is, basically taking advantage of the fact that I'm in a public international law class and, and here you are, so you can answer a question that's been kind of plaguing our class for the last couple weeks. Um, and it's relating to fragmentation and the process that you personally would go to or through um, in weighing conflicting um, international agreements when you're coming to your decision making and how do you interpret uh, international um, obligations that don't necessarily come together nicely when you're trying to make a de uh, decision and, and what kind of thoughts go into that process of weighing the pros and cons of, of abiding by the principles of one and maybe abandoning those of the other. Well, as I indicated to you in my address that while adjudicating the matters which are done predominantly on the international law international convention, custom, treaties, are all taken into consideration while formulating the judgment. Apart from that, the facts of the particular case where different law systems will have some influence, some impact, that also is to be taken into consideration whether the 
common law system, civil law system, all that has to be taken into consideration. But ultimately, what weighs is the international treaties, convention, by which the parties have signed and they are party to that. So all, basically, we will be concentrating on international law while adjudicating our decisions. Thank you very much. So one final question for, for, from me, I suppose. Uh, some people refer to India often as a world unto itself, right? It's the largest democracy of the world. There's one, over 1 1.2 billion people, close to 30 states, seven union territories, uh, very different ethnic groups, religious groups. Uh, so I, my question to you is whether uh, you think it's actually uh, easier or perhaps harder to be at the International Court of Justice where you're dealing with the whole world as opposed to sitting as a judge in India having to contend with, with very difficult issues that are also on a very wide scale, such as dealing with an emergency, for example, uh, trying to maintain national unity or having to uh, step into the role of the executive sometimes when it's not doing its work and so on and so forth. Do you prefer now being at the ICJ, or do you miss your, your former role? <laughs> <laughs> very, very interesting question. Yes, I do my Supreme, miss Supreme Court quite a bit, because unlike any other apex court of the world, everything under the sun can become a matter of adjudication before the Supreme Court. And of late, when a public interest litigation uh, is being done in a big way, then there's no aspect of the entire country which is not dealt by the Supreme Court. I don't think any apex court in the world is dealing with such variety of cases. Now, to give you an example, every Monday, we sit in benches, there are 12 benches now, 13 benches, deal with about 80 matters every Monday and every Friday. And they are disposed of on that day with a short order. Now, to give you an idea, the diversified matters could be, one could be family matter, another could be criminal matter, third could be mining matter, fourth could be night shelter for the poor people, food grains for the poor people, another can be a very intricate commercial matters. So all these matters which come before the Supreme Court and are dealt on a single day, Monday and Friday, which is admission day, makes it very, very fascinating and interesting experience. That kind of experience perhaps would not be available in any other jurisdiction in the world. That's why the Indian court is considered to be the one most, most powerful court in the world now. Previously, we were taking only matter regarding access to justice, where a group of people who could not approach the court because of their poverty, ignorance, or discrimination, then any other person could file a petition in the court, which would be treated as a writ petition, and orders would be passed. Then came another phase where people will approach the court for preserving and protecting ecology and environment. Large number of cases were decided by the court, uh, where directions were given to clean river Ganga, to clean the mountain, polluter pays principle, precautionary principles were all evolved in that process. The third phase, which is the very important phase, which I would be dealing my lecture tomorrow, uh, is a public probity, transparency, and morality in the judgments. Every act, executive decision is now before the court. Now, I don't know whether you are familiar with the 2G matters which are pending before the court, coal get matters which are pending before the court. Now, the Supreme Court has also been criticized for overstepping and taking some of the functions of the legislature and executive. But 
as long as it enjoys the confidence and faith of the people of India is surviving. The moment the people will not have the faith, trust and confidence in the system, perhaps this jurisdiction will not be excised. The people of the country want the court to excise because they are not happy with the other two organs of the state, to say the least. Well, on this note, I would ask you to join me in thanking warmly Justice Bandari for all these notes of wisdom. And I would also ask Justice Bandari to accept little tokens of our appreciation. Uh, thank you so, very from, much. From your passage at Osgoode Hall Law School. Thank, so, you, very thank, you, very, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And so, as you heard, we're, we're, we're a lucky bunch. Uh, we're a lucky bunch because Justice Bandari is going to be with us for a number of days. Uh, he will be, uh, he has a number of other speaking engagements here at the law school and uh, downtown. All of this is advertised on the Osgood website, and I invite you, if you want to hear more about things like public interest and in litigation in India, to go and look at that schedule and make sure to, to attend these talks. Uh, I also want to uh, emphasize that there is a reception in honor of public boundary, will, which will be held <coughs> at 2.30 in the faculty common room. Where is that? Second floor, 2027, next to the dean's office, and you are all Welcome to join us at that time. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Director. I deeply appreciate your gifts and the kind sentiment which you express. I value your sentiment. I value your good wishes. And I value that all of you have taken time to listen to my lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs>